of that. But we all think of, when we think about time, when we think about consciousness, you know, we can see this very strong connection between our conscious experience and the passing of time, and immediately confronted by the distinction between past and future. Nothing, almost nothing seems more elemental and fundamental and basic. But as you'll see, it's part of the program I'm interested in to explain the distinction between past and future in something that's more basic. So it's, it's, it's going to be it's a part of a reductive program. And there are various aspects of this distinction between past and the future, or what's sometimes called time's arrows. Uh, what is the epistemological aspect? Our epistemological relationship to the past and to the future different relationships. It can be characterized in various ways. I think you get deeper and deeper into it. Um, but as a rough first thing, is we generally know much more about the past than we do about the future. We have records and memories and regrets directed at the past but not the future. And this isn't merely a matter of linguistic analysis. I mean, somebody might say, well, it wouldn't be a record if it's about the future. But that doesn't really get very far. Um, right, that's how we use the word. But really, to think about it, somehow we are in a position to, to have knowledge about the past in a way we're not about the future. Um, and most people would say that, well, it has something to do with causation or, or, or reliability or something like that, and we'll talk about that. And, and the other very big, important times arrow or distinction is that um, we think we can make a difference, so that some of the time, to the future. We have some sort of influence of the future, and more than influence, a kind of control, at least over our bodies, except under you know, very uh, special circumstances, like if you're put in a, if you're paralyzed, or put in a straight jacket, or something like that. Even there, you have some control over what goes on in your Brain. But it doesn't seem as though we have any kind of influence or control over the past. Like I said, all this is related to causation, it seems. And causation typically goes from past to future. I mean, people have thought experiments and have imagined what would it be like for them to be time travel and backwards causation. Typically, causation goes in this one temporal direction. Sometimes it's even built into the definition of causation, as some philosophers have done. And causation, of course, is very much connected to influence and control. Uh, in that, uh, when we know what causes what, we can amplify our influence and control. See? Another bit of common sense that's been discussed in philosophy literature for a long time is this idea that we have some sort of free will. Um, <clears throat> exactly what that amounts to, you know, giant books have been written about. But one way of thinking about it, so-called libertarian free will, which I do think is part of common sense. I mean, if I look at myself, I find this, you know, that I am often acting on the presupposition that what I'm doing depends in some way on me, and independent in a certain sense that's maybe hard to really spell out, independent of what goes on be before. Of course, it, uh, being, so being philosophers, we think about this a little bit, and we realize that there's some sort of conflict going on between what the uh, physics tells us about the world, what we have to think about the causal order of the world, and this idea of free will. I have a few words to say about free will and the metaphysics of free will towards the end of this paper. Okay, well, the topic of the, this uh, discussion, this workshop, it was supposed to in some way connect Ernst Mach and physicalism. So let's... Um, characterized physicalism in a rough way. It's been done in contemporary philosophy. A lot of people have characterized it along these terms. David Papado among them. Me and others. Um, so one is that there's some sort of fundamental physical ontology uh, with fundamental physical quantities, relations, and, and laws. There's an issue about saying exactly what physical amounts to here, but I don't think it's as much of a problem as some people have made out to be. You know, it's the kind of thing we can recognize. We know that if uh, uh, somebody said, well, among the fundamental properties is the um, experience of having beer for breakfast, uh, you wouldn't, you'd think that's not physicalism. 
Um, and the idea that every positive contingent fact or truth, or whatever it is, whatever kind of uh, yeah, in the, in the way you want to think about things, it sort of plays the role of facts or truths. Every positive contingent fact or truth is necessitated um, by a positive fact or truth about the distribution of fundamental physical ontology and properties and fundamental laws. Um, so this is the way Frank Jackson and David Chalmers, David Kaplan, all characterize physicalism. Um, it's not quite physicalism because there are views you can take which would strike us as not really physicalistic, which can, are compatible with these claims. But these are certainly necessary for physicalism. I'm not going to get very much into that since that's not the direction this paper is going to go. I tend to think about, and what I'm really interested in, are, is a kind of funda very austere fundamentalist physicalism, which involves there being a theory of everything, what are sometimes called toes. I guess toes are the foundation. Um, so a theory, and I think this is the right way to think about fundamental theories, you know, no one has really proposed a successful, or anyone thinks is the fundamental theory of everything. Um, but the structure of such a theory is more or less going to sat, be in the following ballpark. There'll be something like a fundamental structure. Maybe it'll be a space-time structure, or maybe it'll be something even more fundamental than space-time, from which so-called space and time emerge. That's an idea that's been uh, thought about a little bit. Um, by physicists. And there'll be some sort of fundamental ontology, maybe it consists of particles, maybe a field, <coughs> strings, wave functions, whatever. This is the stuff that occupies the space-time structure. And it'll have certain fundamental properties or relations or quantities or gauges or whatever the right terminology would be. There are different ways of thinking about that. We're not gonna not gonna get into the, you know the physics of this very much. Um, but, but all the physical theories I know about come along with some sort of idea about a fundamental complete state. So in classical mechanics, there are particle positions and momentum things. And there'll be some sort of fundamental dynamical laws, or maybe other fundamental nomological constraints, too. So I think this is a good way to present a the fundamental theory. I think a lot of confusion in, in philosophy of physics would be cleared up, especially when it comes to talking about quantum mechanics, if the uh, discussants were said, put your understanding of the theory in this form. Tell us what the space-time structure is. Tell us what the fundamental ontology properties, or place the role of properties are. Tell us what the fundamental laws are. Um, uh, uh, Mach wouldn't have liked any of this, incidentally. That's clear enough not to say. Okay, so here's a big project. Um, so, uh, uh, which we were calling Describing the World in Physics. The word describing, I guess I contributed to this in part because I was reading something in Shakespeare. I forget, it might have been, uh, you know, Horatio and Hamlet saying he decried uh, uh, Hamlet's father's ghost, Mr. Senior Hamlet. Um, but it means something like seeing something. <laughs> I thought nobody else would ever use this word. I since found actually. It's used from time to time. I thought it was archaic. Anyway. But the idea is basically the same thing, and some of you may be familiar with it, with, um, what, what does Frank Jackson call it? That slip my mind. He has some name for this. You know, sort of seeing uh, non-fundamental facts or truths, understanding why they obtain in terms of more fundamental facts or truths. Oh, he calls it the location problem. Okay, so you know what I mean. So I think this is one of the jobs for philosophers to do, to help us understand how there can be um, uh, planets in a world that consists of, I don't know, fields and, 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 and uh, strings or whatever, um, or how there can be uh, uh, intentionality in a world that consists of biological organisms that themselves consist of particles and moving in various ways and so on. This is the decrying project. Um, then there are different ways in which it might go, can go. Um, one way, as I say over here, is actually a kind of reductionist, or mostly reductionist way of just explaining.